Good morning. Our text this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the second chapter, the first 12 verses. This text comes on what we call Epiphany Sunday. It's the story of the Magi, the wise ones from countries and cultures that were different from the ones Jesus was born into. The Magi who followed a star which led them to the child. I used to think that the whole Magi thing and following the star was a cool, poetic, and literary embellishment to the Jesus story. But it turns out there was very possibly a great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn around that time, just like we had a week ago, which might explain in part why a group of learned scholars may have been particularly fixed on following a star and how that journey brought them to an encounter with a child who would change the world. Our text this morning and the story of the Magi who followed a star which led them to Bethlehem to encounter the baby Jesus comes from Matthew. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise ones from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him and calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where this Messiah was to be born. And they told King Herod in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you Bethlehem in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then King Herod secretly called for the wise ones and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for this child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that that star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary and his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered the child gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. Star words. You've already heard that this morning referred to once or twice. It's kind of a thing in some churches now, so I figured it was high time that we check it out. If you're just joining us and haven't received a word from me by email or during the service, you can send a chat to Priscilla, whose name starts with Usher, and she'll offer you a word. The idea to star words is that at the dawn of a new year, when we're dipping into this story about the wise ones who followed a star which led them to an encounter with the Holy, with the child Jesus, that we receive a word that will be our personal star for the year. A word that can accompany us, can invite us, can provoke us, can ignite us for a whole year. You could cut it out and put it somewhere you'll regularly see it or just remember it. For some of us, these words are full of meaning, challenge, and invitation already. For others, these words are a blank canvas, an invitation for God to enter into our lives. We could think of these words as a gift, a gift that we can continue to open in the next days or months, or if we're up to it for a whole year. I still remember a word that I was offered almost three years ago by a student in one of the seminary classes that I teach who led us in this exercise. And that word has stayed with me ever since. This year, we took a list of star words and I randomly assigned them to the people for whom I had an email address at the time. Again, these assignments were completely random. I couldn't see which word I was giving you until I dropped it into a file or an email. And I then decided after I had sent all the emails that I would take the next word. And I don't like it. I don't like my word. I had seen the words, almost 150 of them, 
I was excited about them and kind of looking forward to getting a word like awe or resist or imagine or seek or dwell or birthing or trust or gratitude or build, but I didn't get any of those. I got the word play and I don't really like it, which I guess makes it a really good word. So here's where you can ditch your word and say, thanks, but I'll pass on this exercise. Except that it kind of was my idea and I randomly assigned the words and now I feel stuck with mine. You could think of this as you can find a meaning in any word or the universe needs you to have this word or God is sending you a message with this word. Ugh, the word play. While I love to create and be spontaneous, some of you who know me well know that I don't like games, board games or card games. I'm afraid that my parents might still be a little disappointed that I never learned how to play bridge. My one possible exception is that I can be talked into playing Scrabble, especially if we're not keeping score. And I hope that this word doesn't mean that I need to play Scrabble for a whole year. It's just that there, there's too much to do this, this in this time to play. And I know that's exactly the point. Well, now you know about me and my word, you may have feelings about your own. I do think that this word, um, as crabby as it might make me at the beginning, is probably a real gift to me. Um, and goodness knows we all need to play a little bit more. The point is, this is one more tool to help guide us in this new time. It's one more star that can lead us, beckon us, point us to the holy, draw us more deeply toward God, into ourselves, and into the world. This is a new year, but the world is the same as it was on Thursday, the last day of 2020. It's not enough just to turn a page on a calendar and hope for new results. I heard the collective sigh when we said goodbye to 2020. And I heard many people heave a big sigh when the presidential result, election results were announced. I know we all needed some good news. I know we needed to see some kind of light at the end of the tunnel. But we are not in the clear. The virus still rages. We are still losing one another. The mad scramble to access the vaccine will reveal even deeper inequities. Poor countries and poor people will be pushed to the back of the line. State-sanctioned violence against black and brown bodies hasn't ended because we elected a new president. White supremacy is not over because Trump is leaving office. If anything, I wager it will get worse. To get different results, we need more than a new page on the calendar or a new president. We need to be different. We can't assume that because an inauguration is happening in 17 days or that some of us are safe at this moment, or can pay our rent without a stimulus check, or are not at risk of being targeted because of this color of our skin, or our gender, or the abilities of our bodies, or may have access to a vaccine soon enough, we can't assume that if we experience any of these things, that we are collectively in the clear. I think that the emphasis on resolutions in a new year is not always helpful. I think it can be more powerful to identify our commitments than to make resolutions. In this new year, although resolutions are powerful, but in this new year, the question is, what are you committing yourself to? How do you wanna show up? Instead of thinking about what we want to do, what if we thought about who we want to be for ourselves, for others, for the earth? As we develop our commitments, we need things that will help keep us on or near course. Words that we can return to, faith, that anchors us, spirit that holds us, the story of Jesus that can teach us, stars we can follow. When there's so much noise around us, so many possibilities, it helps to focus on that star that illumines us and reminds us why we're on this journey. And those stars are not just around us, they're also within us. Joni Mitchell was right. We are, as a matter of fact, made of stardust. And this is where, Emma, some of the chemistry and science comes in. The atoms in our bodies right now were created in the cores of stars billions of years ago. 
We are made of the remnants of stars and massive explosions in the galaxies. The carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosph phosphorus in our bodies are as old as the universe itself. The iron that makes our blood red was created the instant a star died. Everything in our bodies originates with residual stardust, which also finds its way into plants and into the nutrients we need to live. Walt Whitman said it simply and beautifully. He said, a blade of grass is the journey work of the stars. Stars die when the hydrogen at the core is depleted. All the atoms the star has created get distributed in the universe. The spiral patterns that we sometimes see in the galaxy or in images of the galaxy are stardust. Then gravity comes along and clumps that dust together and another star is born. What kind of incredible creation is this that we are made of the dust of stars? That we are in fact the children of the sun and the stars. We are solar powered. If we were wise, we would use this knowledge to grow closer to each other and share the joy and the fear of our brief existence. If we were wise, we would let ourselves feel held by God, by the very forces that keep us moving together at a half million miles an hour around the sun. That's how fast we're going right now is one half million miles we are spinning together around the sun. So this is star time, epiphany, a time when things are revealed, when God's light shines throughout the whole world, a story of wise ones who followed a star which led them to an encounter with the holy. It's an invitation to commitment, to receiving a word, to feeling the stars around us and within us, knowing that they are held and shining in every person on the planet, knowing that we are connected to them in our very atoms and knowing that God holds us all. To close, I'd like to read a blessing by Jan Richardson entitled, How the Stars Get in Your Bones. And as I do, Nick is gonna share with us some images from the Hubble telescope, which have documented the birth of new stars. So these are new stars, which we're seeing. From Jan Richardson. Sapphire, diamond, emerald, quartz. Think of every hard thing that carries its own brilliance, shining with the luster that comes only from uncountable ages in the earth, in the dark, buried beneath unimaginable weight, bearing what seemed impossible, bearing it still. And you, shouldering the grief you had thought so solid, so impermeable, that terrible anguish you carried as a burden, now become, who can say what day had happened? A beginning. See how the sorrow in you slowly makes its own light, how it conjures its own fire. See how radiant even your despair has become in the grace of that sun. Did you think this would happen by holding the weight of the world, by giving in to the press of sadness and time? I tell you this, this blazing in you, it does not come by choosing the most difficult way, the most daunting. It does not come by the sheer force of your will. It comes from the helpless place in you that despite all cannot help but hope. The part of you that does not know how to not keep turning toward this world, to keep turning your face toward the sky, to keep turning your heart toward this unendurable earth, knowing your heart will break, but turning it still. I tell you, this is how the stars get in your bones. This is how the brightness makes a home in you as you open to the hope that burnishes every fractured thing it finds and sets it shimmering. A generous light that will not cease, no matter how deep the darkness grows, no matter how long the night becomes. Still, 
still still the secret of secrets keeps turning in you becoming beautiful becoming blessed kindling the luminous way by which you will emerge carrying your shattered heart like a constellation within you singing to the day that will not fail to come this is god's good news amen <laughs>